Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. James chapter 4 From whence come wars? Ooh, that's an interesting question. And fightings among you? Come they not hence? Even of your lust? That war in your members? Uh oh. So wars result in lust. Ye lust. Read it again. You see, we've taken that word lust and we, oh, you know, pornography, centerfold magazines. And that's not the case in the Bible. Yeah, it's pornography. But lust, also Paul tells us, is coveting. Coveting equals lust, and lust equals coveting. There are many people going to be charged with lust, and they have not looked at a naked picture on a, on a website, on a, in a magazine. They're going to find out that their lust, their centerfold, was a dollar bill, ten dollar bill. Money, business, people. So the motive for war is I want something that you have and you won't give it to me. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have. Cain killed Abel because you got God's gratification and I didn't. Shut up, happy boy. How dare you be happy and joyful? And he killed them. And desire to have coveting, coveting, and cannot obtain. You don't have no chance of getting it. We just read about Naboth's vineyard. Ahab wanted his vineyard, he couldn't do it. And the Jesuit Naboth, he was right by the law. He could not give that land away for money, for a better piece of garden, whatever. The law states that that property belonged to his fathers and is to stay with his fathers. King Ahab got a pity party, went to bed, cried his pants, and his wife stepped in and said, Art thou the king of Israel? Let me take care of it. Wait a minute. Shut up, Hillary. And Naboth died. Why? What did he do wrong that he was stoned? Now, the method of stoning in Israel was... You had to be tried by three people. Jezebel took care of it. Called some men of Beulah Isle and said, All right, so what was the actual crime of Naboth? Nothing. One man did not get what he wanted. And God rebuked the husband and the wife. What are these wars today that America gets herself into? I'm going to say one thing, and it's much more. O-I-L. We can't tax certain people because we get oil from them. We can tax other people because they don't have oil. We're going to be the big nation of all nations on top of all nations. And there are wars throughout the world because somebody wanted something. And it's recorded in the Old Testament that it was even said one time with David. There was a time of wars. There was even calendar dates 
Something like to that fact. Hey, it's wartime. Let's go. One illustration was that they're laying around a pool. That, you know, they, they got the troops together. All right, let's have some war games. And you say, what's the motive of that one? See who's powerful or more. See who can brag about the most military strength. It's the big ego of man. Look who I am. Look how much we have. And that's why David got in trouble for numbering Israel. That's why God told Israel, don't you number them. Don't you do a census. Because you may rely on those numbers rather than rely on me. Don't worry about how many tanks or camels you have. You rely on me. Cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not. Because you ask not. Uh-oh. We don't have because we did not ask God. <clears throat> I mean, as a nation under God, we do not ask God for his approval about our military actions. We do not seek God. Our president seeks Congress but does not seek God. I have not ever seen a nation get together under one God, which is mostly right, is that what they said, one God, individual, and say, Lord, what do we do? No, we just, you just hear, next day we sent missiles. Well, who prayed about it? Ye ask, okay, you ask, and receive not. Uh-oh. So God answers prayer by yes, no, not now. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Some of our prayers to God, oh God, please tickle my fancy, make me feel so great. Lord God, please let me eat all the chocolate and sweets in my life without ever having a problem with diabetes. And God's like, diabetes is what's keeping you in prayer life with me. Diabetes is my way of correcting you. No. I'm not going to remove that diabetes from you because it keeps you under hand. It keeps you obedient. And we do ask God for things of our coveting love. <coughs> Lust. Oh, God, please, give me that big, fancy race car. Why? I just gave you a hatchback with two doors, and you couldn't even take care of that. You expect me to? I just gave you $10, and that $10 went out the window. Now you owe $15. You want me to give you money? So, our trouble is we ask God not, and we ask God, and sometimes, you know what? not to our well-being it's like a, uh, your son comes up to you he's five years old he's got your razor daddy teach me how to shave no not now later we become a teenager I'll teach you but right now no it's dangerous It'd be like you know uh, your, your daughter or your son come to you and say hey I'm married we're gonna have a baby we're, we're gonna get a Corvette uh, Where's the baby going to sit? Oh, then think about that. See, lust, lust, lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, both sexes, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity, that is enemy, hatred, unfriendly with God. The Bible also calls that whoredom. When you sexually arouse yourself with the world and their friendship it angers God he likens it to the three top sins in the Bible boredom whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world black and white is the enemy of God so when you bring the world into your church to gain saints to gain people to get saved you are actually an enemy of God because you're being a friend. Help me, Lord. I mean, excuse me. Help me, world, so I can get more of the Lord's people. Oh, world, they like rock music. Well, God, we can take their rock music and apply it to Christianity. 
No. Do ye think that the scripture said is in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us, that's a clue, lust is to envy. Galatians 5.17 says the Holy Spirit is against the flesh, and the flesh is against the Holy Spirit. So that spirit that dwells in me and dwells in you, what's it say? It lusteth to envy. It's in our human nature from Adam and sin. We lust and we envy. We sin. That's in our nature. But he, God, giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Oh, there's a verse right there. Nothing prideful, lofty, is of God. When a preacher gets up, I am proud of, you lie. You are lying against God. Because no pre preacher should get up in a pulpit and say, proud or pride. That's against God. Proud to be American. Made in America. That's a sin. And yet those that are humble, he giveth grace. There is no grace given to the proud. I'm so proud of our church. Look at the congregation. Look how many people came to Sunday school. Look how many people got balloons and ate goldfish. No. No. And pride in this, again, is numbering. When you start numbering, we got such a such amount of people coming. We had such amount of people came. That's pride. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit. As a wife is to submit herself to the husband. You are to submit yourself, male or female, to God. Resist, that's turn down, refuse, defy, prevent the devil. Now, Job 41 says that the devil, Satan, is pride. So this is not just, Satan, get away from me. In the context we're talking about, it's pride, loftiness. Submit yourselves. But he that giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. <coughs> Excuse me, been sick. Try to read that in one thing. Submit yourself, therefore, in context of verse 6, to God, resist the devil, get rid of your pride, get rid of being proud, lofty, and he will flee from you. If you're humble, Satan's, I can't do nothing with him. He's going to try to break your humbleness like Job 1 and 2. But he can't be partnered with you because Satan's high on the banner. He's high on the chair. He's high on, you know, I want Jesus to fall down and worship me. And I'll give you everything. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So it's possible to resist the devil. Draw nigh to God. Submit yourselves. Resist. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. After you resist the devil. And got rid of your pride. God is not going to draw nigh to you. If you say, come on, Satan. Let's, let's have a ball. Come on, Satan. Let's do it your way. Come on, Satan. Look who I am. Isn't it great? God, aren't you great that I showed up in church? There were some people, man, I, I, I swear, it's not that church made God happy that day. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Ooh, ooh he's, he's breaking sins and double mind. I want God. Oh, I want Satan. I'm cold, but I'm hot. I'm lukewarm. I'm saved, but I'm not saved. I'm always going to go to heaven. Uh, maybe I'm not going to go to heaven. I love Jesus, and what we read, yeah, you see what that family's doing? Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Oh, look at that. 
being sorrow. Joy is not always the best thing. Sorrowness, weeping, gets you closer to God and gets you praying. Mourn, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Matthew 5, 4. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. Now, 44 times in the Bible, evil in the sight of the Lord is mentioned. 44 times. And most of those are written about the kings. This king got on the throne at such and such age, reigned such amount of time, his mother was such and such, and he did evil in the sight. Forgive <coughs> me. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. God sees you, evil or good. He sees you. Humble yourself. That's been the context of what we've read so far. Do not be in pride. You know what the Jews' problem was? As he's writing the Jews, chapter 1, verse 1. I'm of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Forget that. Forget that. J John the Baptist said, hey, you know, Abel's in these rocks. Forget that. It's no more Abraham. It's no more you being a Jew. Are you saved under the blood of Jesus Christ? Not of works. At least any man boasts. You know why there's going to be no wars in heaven? Because we're not going there with our works. We're not going to be able to say, well, I had a bigger Sunday school than you had. What were you doing here? Well, I had a bigger bus ministry. You had none. Well, that's okay. 10% of the people up here right now are because of me. It ain't going to be any of that. We're going to be on there by the merit and only by the merit of Jesus Christ. Get off your high horse. Some people's pulpits are elevated, and so is the pastor. Elevation. I had a pastor like that one time. You couldn't talk to him. He was elevated. Oh, I wonder what he's doing today. I don't care. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Look at the, look at the story of Ruth. By Ruth, who she was, a mode of She... God didn't care about the Moabites. They were enemies of Israel. They wouldn't help Israel. If she was humble. She was willing to help a Jew, Naomi. She was working. She was dedicated. And she is now in the line of Jesus Christ, and she never lifted herself up. Study the life of Ruth if you want to learn how to be humble. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. Oh, now we're turning right to the saints, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judges his brother, say, speaketh evil of the law, and judges the law. What if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.15 says we can judge things. 1 Corinthians 6 3 says we're going to judge angels. I can look at your life as a Christian saying, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that. Book, chapter, and verse. Or, you know, you need to grow a little more. Let's grow. I can help you grow. Book, chapter, and verse. But judging by a man's skin color, by what he's wearing, we already read about that, what kind of car he comes. No, that, that stuff is pitiful. We ought not to be judging others, unless it's to improve. Unless it's to help. See, a lot of people go, judge not least you be judged. There are helpful judges. Listen, if I train up a child and say, you know, daughter, if you're going to cross a road, you better look both ways. Judge not least be judged. Well, you visit your kid in the emergency room, and maybe the mortician's office. But if I teach my child to walk, look both ways before she crosses that road, I have a 99% chance I won't be seeing her in the emergency room being hit by a car. I have judged her to look both ways that, you know what? To be safe. We've seen people go right through red lights. You're not judging properly. That light means red. But you think it means something else. 
And I have judged you breaking the law. I have judged you unworthy to be driving a car. So there are judgments. And we don't be bickering about it. We don't be, you know, we got to be more sensible and prayerful about it. There's one lawgiver, Isaiah 35, 22, says it's God who is able to save. Uh-oh. A God that saves. One. That must be Jesus Christ. Able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? God maketh the rich and he maketh the poor. He maketh the wealthy, he maketh the poor. He maketh those that are good health, he maketh those that are not in good health. So, we can't change God. Go to now. Ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into the, such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. I've got plans on my on my calendar. I'm writing it down. I'm going to do this on such and such. I got an appointment. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? I mean, they made a game show about that. Anything but the Bible. It's a vapor. You ever seen a vapor? It's not smoke. It's a vapor. You can see right through it. It's gone as quick as it came. Vapor. It's water. That appears for a little time. And then vanish away. And you got to ask yourself. How many calendars have been thrown away? How many times have, have your relatives gone into your room, place, wherever you are, and looked at your appointment book and, well, your spouse looks on the refrigerator, well, he had an appointment tomorrow, got to call and cancel that. And I, this is something I stress all the time when I'm preaching on the streets down in Daytona. You don't know if you have this afternoon. For, ye, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will. It is perfectly proper and, and biblical to say, uh, will you meet us at dinner at noon? Lord willing. We all say, you ought to say. How's that? We shall live and do this or that. Can't make a promise. Alright, let's say, I promise you I'm going to do this thing. And whatever reason, however, you die before you do it. Lord, I got my sins all in the blood. I'm doing something. Yeah, but you now at either judgment. If you're, if you're a Christian, I promise you, and you died before that day. You have now got wood, hair, or stubble because you just lied. I have the best intentions. No. The only way to get you out from, from a, a thing that you have made yourself committed to, Lord willing. And that's only if, if the Lord intervenes. You say, well, I'll meet you Friday at noon. And you don't want to go. You make, oh, I don't feel good today. That don't work. Now you're in a hospital. You're sick. You have something you can do. The Lord will. It says, ought to say. But now ye rejoice in your boasting. Oh, we can't shut up on that, can we? All such rejoicing is evil. Conclude. Because 17 is a whole different subject. Just want to finish this paragraph up to remind you. Boasting. And worldliness. You know, the, the people who go out and root for their sports team and they dress up in their colors and they they got the season tickets. They got the hands with number one. They got the license plate. It was funny. I'm just gonna pick a team. Someone will probably hate me because I didn't pick their team. I have seen many Boston Red Sox number one fans on their license plate in their car. They got to wonder, you know, you got to be two, three, four, five, six, or seven. You can't be all number one baseball fans. But that's boasting in one team. Your boasting, I think, is on. Oh, look at me! Look what I did. Look yeah. 
these these people that talk on these news programs and sit down at the table and say, they're both look how great we are and then people telling you that who have jobs that you know well you know I don't know why those people can't get work uh, you know you know, shut up you may lose it it's glorifying yourself and not God how about Lord God you know I just want to thank you our house is full and we, we, the bills are taken care of it's nothing I've done it's something you've done they both of their jobs <coughs> 17 therefore this is this, here we go therefore to him that knoweth to do good they know what is good and do with it not to him it is sin there's no excuse you cannot get an excuse when you have been told what to do and you don't do it that is sin in the eyes of God now as far as us again I, what I know street ministry when I tell someone to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved from hell that is good that's good news that's the gospel. And they don't do it. That's the sin that will put them in hell. All right? We get a, they're, they're Christians down there. We're down there. We preach the gospel. They hear what we're doing. And they don't go find out, well, why are they doing that? What are they doing? When the Bible says go and preach the gospel, and they don't do it, to them it's sin. So, there's a lot of sins in my life. I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm going to stand as a sin because it was good, but I didn't do it. And maybe a lot of those sins I don't know that I was supposed to do, that I didn't do, are going to be unconfessed sins. I can't finish my life with James 4, 17 saying I'm sinless. Because James 4, 17, that, that, everybody. That goes from the toddler that, that's going to take that cookie to the old man in the nursing home that whatever he's doing wrong that he knows is good. All have sinned. There you go. All is it. And if we are born in us, by God, we are. And God has put into our hearts that there is a creator. That's good. And you worship anything else, but that's not good. That's a sin. What a wonderful God is.